sent me racing through the rest of Adam Smith's considerable body of writing to track down more Shakespearean references. So tonight, if my slides will cooperate, which they won't, give me a minute. Uh, tonight, what I want to do is focus on three of those references um, to Shakespeare in the works of Adam Smith. And all of those references are from the wealth of nations and the theory of moral sentiments. So I'm not cherry picking. Here. It would be really easy to go through Smith's work on rhetoric and belles lettres, or his, um, uh, or his uh, lectures on philosophical topics, and pull out references to literature and to the drama. That's the easy part. Um, the more interesting part is finding those references in uh, economic works like Wealth of Nations and in serious philosophy like the theory of moral sentiments. And all of these references are references to a single Shakespeare play. Macbeth. Now, aside from being a lot of fun to read with its ghouls and witches and ghosts, uh, Macbeth interests me, and it seems particularly relevant to Smith's concerns because of its focus on the merits and the hazards of one particular human institution. But we're going to get towards that. Uh, we're going to get more on that towards the end of the talk. So let's start by looking at these references. As I've noted already, Adam Smith's respect for literature as art and as example infuses all of his work. Whether it's the theory of moral sentiments and its use of Shakespeare's characters Iago and Othello to talk about issues of human sympathy and fellow feeling, or the quotations from Milton and Dryden which begin Smith's famous essay on the history of astronomy, whether it's his references to Phaedra, the Aeneid, and the Iliad in his examination of the legal history of marriage, in the lectures on jurisprudence, or the full contents of his lectures on rhetoric and belles lettres, uh, which are the notes from his most extended considerations of literature. Smith's use of literary references throughout his body of work is constant. Now, Charles Griswold's excellent book, Adam Smith and the Virtues of Enlightenment, points to the strong appeal that literature had for Smith as a way to speak about important contemporary moral concerns. Not only plays, novels, and poems, but tragedies in particular intrigue Smith. Together, they completely overwhelm his relatively rare references to properly philosophical texts. The notion that we are to understand literature and drama as sources for moral theory and moral education is clearly and strikingly evident in The Wealth of Nations as well. That's from Griswold's book, Adam Smith and the Virtues of Enlightenment. Now, this attraction towards the literary as source material for moral arguments is easily seen simply by leafing through the footnotes to any of Adam Smith's works. His references to literature are myriad, and most of them has, have been well documented. In her book, Economic Sentiments, Emma Rothschild uh, outlines the most famous of those references when she examines the connection between Smith's idea of the invisible hand and the workings of the same idea in Macbeth. The earlier intellectual history of invisible hands turns out to be generally grim. The most famous invisible hand in Anglo-Scottish literature is that of Macbeth's providence. And with thy bloody and invisible, invisible hand, Macbeth apostrophizes the knight in Act 3. Immediately, uh, when immediately before the banquet and Banquo's murder, he asks the darkness to cover up the crimes he is about to commit. He says, and I'm going to put this on the screen because um, particularly for those who are not dealing with English as a first language, uh, Shakespeare can go by mighty fast. Um, so here is the text and also the textual reference if you want to have a look at that. So Macbeth is about to hire a bunch of people to murder his best friend. And he speaks tonight to ask Knight to help him conceal the crimes that he is plotting. And he says, Come, sealing Knight, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand, cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. 
Now Smith, who lectured on Shakespeare's use of, use of metaphor, says Rothschild, is quite likely to have known Macbeth well. Rothschild further notes that the wealth of nations is full of anecdotes of secret self-interest in which the pursuit of material gain is uncovered behind the mysterious veil of self-delusion. But these anecdotes are directed, above all, against the wise and the great, against emperors and theorists, including the theorist who whispers in the ear of the reforming emperor, far more than against the individuals, who are their objects and subjects. She adds further that Smith's principal examinations of self-interested behavior in the wealth of nations include manufacturers and incorporated towns, parish worthies, dukes, kings, ministers, established clergy, and university teachers. Smith's reference to Macbeth and the Invisible Hand clearly fits in with this set of cautionary examples and emphasizes, again, how deeply entwined Smith's reference to Macbeth is with so many of the primary concerns of the wealth of nations. Now, it's worth noting here that Smith could have gotten the image of the Invisible Hand from other sources, um, fairy tales, uh, various um, biblical references, the Invisible Hand writing on the wall in the Book of Daniel. Uh, but I follow Rothschild in thinking that the multiplicity of Shakespearean references in Smith, the applicability of Macbeth to his subject matter, as well as the other two references on which I'd like to focus the remainder of my talk, are strong evidence that, she, that Smith had Macbeth in mind. Now I want to pause here for a moment uh, to share some more current references references to the invisible hand. There's absolutely no academic value to any of this. I just think it's funny, and I like to show people these invisible hand cartoons. So we're going to stop for a minute and note that there's an unseen hand behind everything we do, especially if we are sock puppets. Uh, that the invisible hand has shown up in The New Yorker recently um, with the economic decline. And that perhaps the unseen hand of the market is what we really need to solve some of parenting's great quandaries. But back to our topic. Um, corruption, collusion, and the erosion of human sympathy, sympathy through misdirected self-interest are some of the most pressing themes in Shakespeare's play about Scottish kings, written for a new Scottish king. They're also the deepest fears of all of those who believe that a free market functioning freely is one of the best solutions to human needs and desires. So it's no surprise then that when Adam Smith, the Scottish professor, professor of rhetoric and the champion of free markets, worries about the vulnerability of the market to human imperfection, he begins to think about Macbeth and comes up with that chilling image of the invisible hand. But in addition to explicit quotations, from literature, like this direct reference to the invisible hand, Smith's writing, which is steeped in poetry, novels, and drama, often draws from the storehouse of his memory to allude to literature without giving the specific reference to the work of which he's thinking. The discovery and examination of such an unsighted reference can give careful readers the sense of Smith as a writer who instinctively turns to literature as a tool for his thinking. So very early on in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, we encounter one such reference, which I believe is previously unnoted in Smith's scholarship. During Smith's meditations on human nature as demonstrated in comparison with the nature of dogs. Now this is an enormously famous uh, section of the text. Anyone who's read Adam Smith has noticed it. Anyone who has discussed the Wealth of Nations has probably commented on it. And those of you who are familiar with Wealth of Nations, which I would wager a lot of you listening are, um, have probably noticed it. The section is elegant in its content and in its diction, as well as in its explication of the social advantages and conveniences that arise from the human ability to truck, barter, and exchange with skills that dogs, by contrast, are able only to use to help themselves. I will put up a section of this on screen here and read the rest of it to you. Smith writes, by nature, a philosopher is not in genius and disposition half so different from a street porter as a mastiff is from a greyhound, or a greyhound from a spaniel, or this last from a shepherd's dog. 
Those different tribes of animals, however, though all of the same species, are of scarce any use to one another. The strength of the mastiff is not, in the least, supported either by the swiftness of the greyhound or the sagacity of the spaniel, spaniel or by the docility of the shepherd's dog. The effects of these different geniuses and talents, for want of the power or disposition to barter and exchange, cannot be brought into a common stock, and do not in the least contribute to the better accommodations and convenience of the species. Each animal is still obliged to support and defend itself, separately and independently, and derives no sort of advantage from that variety of talents with which nature has distinguished its fellows. Among men, on the contrary, the most dissimilar geniuses are of use to one another. The different produces of their respective talents by the general disposition to truck, barter, and exchange, being brought, as it were, into a common stock, where every man may purchase whatever part of the produce of other men's talents he has occasion for. Everyone's read this passage. Everyone's analyzed this passage. Smith's comparison between the different specialized talents of specific dog breeds and the different specialized talents of different people is expertly contrasted with the inability of dogs to coordinate those special talents through the market, while humans are able to truck, barter, and exchange in order to gain wealth and productivity. And this passage is still used by economists who want to talk about the human institution of the market. Contemporary experimental economist and Nobel Prize winner Vernon Smith has looked into modern studies of animal behavior and found more cooperation than Smith observed, leading to questions about how uniquely human such exchanges are. But what has gone unnoticed is that Smith's passage alludes to an equally well-known passage from Shakespeare's Macbeth. Um, for those of you who know Macbeth well, um, it's interesting to note that um, the play might have been brought to Adam Smith's mind by his use of the word porter early on in the passage um, and the possibility of that reminding him of the famous Act II porter scene in Macbeth. Uh, for those of you who aren't terrifically familiar with Macbeth, you can just ignore what I said. Um, however, as uh, Macbeth is hiring people to murder uh, his best friend Banquo in Act 3, he takes a few moments to pause and discuss human nature with the murderers for hire. And he does so in almost precisely the same terms that Smith uses in this passage we've just read. That Smith, here's Shakespeare. He says to the murderers, are you man enough to murder Banquo? Um, and the murderers say to him, well, we are men. Um, and Macbeth notes in return, well, but there's all different kinds of men. In the catalog, you go for men, as hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, chefs, water rugs, and demi-wolves are clept all by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike and so of men. The similarity of wording here, of subject matter, even of the types of dog breeds that are mentioned, make it clear that as Smith wrote his passage on dogs and human nature, Shakespeare's lines were in his mind. Thus it was a great pleasure to find another apparent reference to Macbeth in Smith's theory of moral sentiments. In his section on the effects of prosperity and adversity upon the judgment of mankind with regard to the propriety of action, there's nothing like an 18th century chapter title, is there? Smith gives an extended account of the dangerous risks associated with desiring too rapid and too easy a rise to a position of wealth and esteem. He writes, to attain this envied situation, the candidates for fortune too frequently abandon the paths of virtue. For unhappily, the road which leads to the one and that road which leads to the other lie sometime in the very opposite directions. But the ambitious man flatters himself that in the splendid situation to which he advances, he will have so many means of commanding the respect and admiration of mankind and will be enabled to act with such superior propriety and grace that the luster of his future conduct 
will entirely cover or efface the foulness of the steps by which he arrived at that elevation. In many governments, the candidates for the highest stations are above the law, and if they can attain the object of their ambition, they have no fear of being called to account for the means by which they acquire it. They often endeavor, therefore, not only by fraud and falsehood, the ordinary and vulgar arts of intrigue and cabal, but sometimes by the perpetration of the most enormous crimes, by murder and assassination, by rebellion and civil war, to supplant and destroy those who oppose or stand in the way of their greatness. They most frequently miscarry, then succeed, and commonly gain nothing but the disgraceful punishment which is due to their crime. But though they should be so lucky as to attain that wished for greatness, they are always most miserably disappointed in the happiness which they expect to enjoy in it. It is not ease or pleasure, but always honor of one kind or another, though frequently an honor very ill understood that the ambitious man really pursues. But the honor of his exalted station appears both in his eyes and in those of other people, polluted and defiled by the baseness of the means through which he rose to it. Now, in this long section of Theory of Moral Sentiments, um, Smith immediately follows it with a reference to Julius Caesar. But I suspect that Macbeth was very much on his mind as he wrote it. The outline of the story that Smith tells here is the outline of the plot of Macbeth. Overcome with the desire to become king, prodded incessantly by his wife, Macbeth murders King Duncan, the legitimate king of Scotland, forsakes the path of virtue for the path of fortune, and is, for the remainder of the play, miserably disappointed in the results. For while Macbeth does become king, Macbeth is, as Smith says, in his own eyes and in those of other people, polluted and defiled by the baseness of the means through which he rose to it. As another Scottish noble notes of Macbeth late in the play, now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarvish thief. And surely, Macbeth's encounter with the ghost of his murdered best friend, Banquo, and Lady Macbeth's famous sleepwalking scenes are best described as their being, in Adam Smith's words, secretly pursued by the avenging furies of shame and remorse, and while glory seems to surround him on all sides, he himself, in his own imagination, sees black and foul infamy fast pursuing him, and every moment ready to overtake him from behind. Or in Shakespeare's words, unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Equally, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's repeated pleas for the return of their ability to sleep peacefully are echoed in Smith's words, he invokes in vain the dark and dismal powers of forgetness and oblivion and in Macbeth's continued recourse to the witches for information and prophecy. But Smith's passage here has more than just plot lines in common with Macbeth. Scholars of Shakespeare have long noted the importance of the words fair and foul in the play. The witches shriek, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and fill the air, before flying off the stage after the play's dramatic opening scenes. And the first words spoken in the play by Macbeth just a few moments later are, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Right? These are words that serve to intimately tie Macbeth to the witches in the play and to the evil that they represent. Shakespeare's repetition of words like foul and defiled sound a chime, ring some bells with close readers of his work and of Shakespeare's. But the most telling connection is Smith's, Smith's assertion that in many governments the candidates for the highest stations are above the law, and if they can attain the object of their ambition, they have no fear of being called to account for the means by which they acquired it. I'm going to put a little Smith and a little Shakespeare up on the screen here. Because this description that Smith has just given of what happens with power is inarguably Macbeth's assumption about his own status at the beginning of the play. If he can kill the current king of Scotland and gain the throne for himself, he will be above all repercussions. He will be beyond the power of the law. 
When Lady Macbeth sleepwalks and revisits the arguments she used to persuade Macbeth to murder King Duncan, she uses the same phrasing that Adam Smith does here to ask, why should they be afraid of being caught? What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to account? It would be more surprising if someone who knew Macbeth as well as Adam Smith did, and who already had the play in mind when working on theory of moral sentiments, did not reference it during a discussion of ambition. For what more powerful representation of the evils of vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other side can there be than Macbeth, who declares, for mine own good, all causes shall give way. So, so what? Here's our skeptical cat regarding our tale with suspicion. Why do I think that this matters? Right? Uh, it would be, I expect, fairly easy to argue that, yes, sure, Adam Smith is an educated, uh, literate man. These accidental references to uh, Shakespeare's work appear throughout his work. They don't really mean anything. He's just dropping some, some fancy words to impress people, some literary allusions to amuse himself, or he's doing it without even realizing it. It doesn't really matter. But I think it matters enormously. And here's why I think it matters. I think it matters because Macbeth, as a play, is deeply concerned with an institution for which Shakespeare has an enormous amount of respect. That institution is the monarchy. But along with his great amount of respect for the monarchy, Shakespeare has deep and abiding concerns about the liability of that institution to corruption. Anyone living in the 16th and 17th centuries in England or anywhere in Europe has these concerns. And they are primary for Shakespeare, and they are primary throughout the course of Macbeth, which focuses on the assassination of a good king, the acclamation of a bad king, and then the corrupting influence of that bad king on Scottish society at large. So what that means is that Shakespeare is thinking about the ways in which something that he loves and something that he respects are potentially corruptible by the lack of character and the lack of virtue in human beings. We might well say the same thing about Adam Smith's thinking about the market, which is an institution that he loves and that he respects and that he values and that is similarly open to corruption and to problematic behavior by other human beings. But here's the distinction that I want to draw. And here's the distinction that I think matters the most for you guys in Students for Liberty. And here's the slide that I want you to remember. If you don't remember anything else, if you don't remember any of the Macbeth quotations, if you don't remember any of the Adam Smith quotations, if you don't remember anything about the time that we're spending together today, here's the thing that I want you to remember. When Shakespeare talks about the, uh, the invisible hand that controls destiny in Macbeth, he talks about the bloody and invisible hand, the hand on the left of the screen here. That's the hand of the state. That's the hand of the monarchy. When it goes awry, blood gets spilled. When Adam Smith references Shakespeare's use of the invisible hand in his economic work, he drops the word bloody. The market doesn't have a bloody and invisible hand. The market's hand is just invisible. It is free of the force and of the aggression of the bloody and invisible hand of the state. That's the important difference, and that, I think, is the big so what of this talk and the big reason that these references are so interesting to me. And I'm going to stop there because that should give us a lot of time for questions. If people have any, um, I am happy to entertain them. So 
Yeah, I'm not sure how to, if I, I'm going to hand this back, I'm going to hand control of this back to Yale. Okay, we and, are uh, back. You can see if there are any questions. Sure, and uh, you can use the GoToWebinar uh, panel there on the right of your screen. If you are listening, uh, you can go ahead and send in a question. If you uh, would like to chat as well, you can use that, but either way, you can also raise your hand. We shall recognize you and get your questions put in. So, don't line up all at once now. I guess I, I have a question that uh, we can start off with. Obviously, when Smith, sure. was, Smith was writing, he had in mind the canon of literature that had been presented to him uh, during and throughout his education. And it's, it's mm -hmm. much the same for today's philosophers or economists. So I have to wonder, in your opinion, what is going to be the main cultural influence for a lot of the the economist, uh, for the academics, for the philosophers who will be writing works today, but which may be very, very pertinent in the future? Oh, that's a really good question. That's a, that's a predict what about modern culture will still be being read in 400 years kind of a question. Um, wow, I'm seriously underqualified to answer that. Um, but I will take a stab at it. Um, Judging from, judging from what I see about the way that cultural production and cultural reception is working now, I think that we have a, a, um, a sort of a splintering of, of cultural markets. There's no, um, there's nothing any being produced anymore that everybody has to read or everybody has to know about. Um, it seems because of the, the capabilities of technology to really target marketing to specific groups and the capabilities that we have to pick and choose what we see. When I was a kid growing up in the United States, there were three television channels, maybe four. Um, I'm not sure how many there are um, at this point. Um, but we can, we can select um, so much from a, such a wider range. And then when we talk about being able to get things um, from overseas, when we talk about being able to download um, shows or um, web series or podcasts or, or individual um, preoccupations to our smartphones and take them with us wherever we go, there's not that same sort of um, overarching um, cultural influence from one particular thing that's currently being produced. I do think we see um, being taken seriously now um, television and web dramas, um, things like uh, House of Cards, um, True Detective, um, podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale, which is a, a huge favorite of mine. Um, these are cultural productions that one would tend to think of as being sort of transient and, and, and fluffy. But of course, Shakespeare's material was thought of as being sort of transient and disposable in the day. Um, nobody knew that it was going to last for 400 or 500 years. So it's a little hard to predict. That the best prediction is that we're not going to be able to predict what our descendants 500 years from now are going to find fascinating. Um, but I do think we are attending closely to some of the things that, that we're uh, that we are producing in some of these newer venues. Um, there's a new book out on um, the economics of uh, the television show The Simpsons um, that just came out this week, um, which is probably a good example of, of the kind of thing we might still be talking about later. Okay, thank you. And also, welcome to Night Vale. Note that. That's a good podcast, it seems. Don't see any other questions now. We have a very shy audience. Oh, there's one that just came in. Uh, this one is from Matej, who's uh, phoning in from Slovenia. 
What were the other literary influences on Smith you recognize in his writings? I guess any kind of other literary references other than Shakespeare that uh, probably Smith used in his writing or that influenced him. Um, oh, there are so many. Um, he is an enormous fan of the French drama. Um, and I'm doing all this from memory. I do not have my uh, complete Smith open up on my desk at the moment. Uh, but he's an enormous fan of the French drama and of drama in particular. Um, he um, is not particularly a fan of the novel, um, probably because it hadn't reached um, its height uh, as, a, as a literary product yet. Um, and he loves the, class, but the classics, um, both the classical dramatists um, and also the epic poets are enormously important to him. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? I hope that helps. Um, there's uh, Charles Griswold's um, book provides some really useful um, some really useful discussion of the things that that Smith refers to most often. Um, and if you get the um, Glasgow edition of the the works of Adam Smith, um, which it's, I will now sound like a commercial, which Liberty Fund produces for a low rate, um, easily attainable through our website, um, great for weddings and Christmas presents. Um, but if you get a, a look at the um, Wealth of Nations and Theory of Moral Sentiments in the Glasgow edition, they are copiously footnoted with, um, uh, with, with helpful, um, helpful footnotes on Adam Smith's references. Also, Ryan Hanley, I'm going to type that, that name here for you. Um, Ryan Hanley has um, an edition of the Theory of Moral Sentiments that came out in the past five to ten years that I think does an even better job of, um, sorry I misspelled Ryan's name, how embarrassing, um, that uh, catches some references that the Glasgow edition missed. Um, and all of those things will help you track down um, Smith's sources and, and footnotes. Um, but in general, he's an enormous fan of, of dramas, less of a fan of prose works. Um, he likes, um, in painting, he likes representational art. Um, the more representational, the better. He does not care for the abstract. OK, great. And the website is libertyfund.org for all of you who are interested in seeking out presents for your loved ones. <laughs> And we have one question from Juan Ruiz Ramos. When the state intervenes in the market and corrupts it, could we say that the market's hand gets a little bloody? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the state spends a lot of time smearing blood on the hands of, of the market. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, a, that's a perfect analogy um, that, you know, the state brings its force to bear on the peaceful and voluntary interactions of the market, and yeah, blood gets put back on the hands that, that were invisible and, and at least relatively clean. All good. And of course, as a reminder, you can use your GoToWebinar uh, little toolbar there on the right. You can ask any question that you like. This is your direct chance. You don't have to fly all the way to Indiana. Uh, you can just do it right now from your computer. <laughs> So uh, I guess one, I'll, uh, I'll jump the line yeah. here. Why not? Um, one thing that you sort of are alluding to in this is the importance of sort of cultural references for trying to get ideas across or especially drawing from them. And I have to wonder, as uh, libertarians or those who are probably more aware of the transgressions of the state, what role do we have in sort of creating culture? What role do we have in trying to influence those who are, let's say, the artists, uh, whether it be in music or painting, I mean, what, what should we do to try to reach out? Is there a way to broaden our ideas? Yeah, I, th I think this is a really important question, and I think it's something that we need to do a lot better 
Um, I, I just I have just been spending um, my entire morning um, writing a piece about um, Henry David Thoreau's book Walden, um, which has been coming under attack for being anti-capitalist and pro-green and generally anti-liberty and bad, bad, bad. Um, the problem is that when you actually read the book, um, it's it's filled with pro-liberty. Uh, material, it's actually filled with praise for commerce, um, and it's much more complicated than our side, uh, speaking loosely, is giving it credit for being. So one of the things that we need to do is to not take for granted, either from the people we think of as being on our side or the, from the people who we think of as being not on our side, not taking for granted that what they tell us about a given work of literature is true. There's no way to tell what's in Macbeth, or what's in Thoreau's Walden, or what's in Shakespeare's sonnets, or what's in any other work of literature without actually going and reading it for yourself. And if you read it for yourself without letting somebody tell you what's in it, tell you what you're going to find, you might find some very surprising material in it. Um, in addition to the work on Thoreau that I was doing this morning, I've been um, giving some talks recently on Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, Shakespeare has, because of Merchant of Venice, a very anti-market reputation. Um, when you read the sonnets, in addition to uh, Merchant of Venice, you discover actually that there is pro-market material in there and praise for making a profit and praise for charging interest. Um, and we've been ignoring that, and we haven't been talking about that. And when we don't notice those things, and when we don't talk about those things, a couple of things happen. One, we lose our literary allies, which means we lose the ability to ally ourselves with great minds like Thoreau and great minds like Shakespeare. And that's a problem, right? We don't want to lose, we don't want to have people who are on our side uh, claimed for the other side. We don't want to let them slip away from us as champions of liberty and champions of the things that we care about. And the other thing that happens is that when we try to talk to people who care enormously about Shakespeare or about Thoreau or about any kind of literature and about any kind of art, we sound like idiots because we haven't read the works and we're taking for granted what is in them. And that's an enormous problem. So we, we need to remedy that. Um, and we need to remedy it um, for the ability to disciplinary boundaries and we need to remedy it for the sake of our own history and we need to remedy it for our reputation. Great and actually I look very much forward to reading the Walden article and in most modern uh, copies of the book that come out it always comes with on the duty of civil disobedience at the very end where he goes to prison because he doesn't want to pay the taxes for the Mexican-American war so <laughs> obviously not a green yes. paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. I've always thought civil disobedience was one of the great libertarian works of all time. So, um, and I think there's a good case to be made for paying a lot of attention to Walden. So we'll see. I'll, I'll let you know when it comes out. Great. I have one question from Roberto Latore, who is actually in Vienna, sitting probably a few kilometers away from me. First off, <laughs> thank you very much for such an interesting approach. However, I got a little confused. My interpretation was more that it was an unintended hand, much more like Hayek's catalaxy or Mises's catalactics, which is that by the mm -hmm. process by which individuals, even though they might hate one another, they end up trading with each other, even when they're pursuing their own self-interest, and they still trade with one another, and even when they did not intend it, the end aggregate result was that this unintended hand uh, came about. So his his all about the confusion of the invisible hand and what it actually means. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, that you're absolutely right that this this is you've given a very good description of the invisible hand of the market, and that this is the reason why Smith is able to um, uh, abstract the the adjective of bloody from it. His invisible hand is invisible because it is. Uh, voluntary and peaceful, and it is often voluntary and peaceful without anybody even needing to know that they're trading with each other or that they're making good things happen for each other. Um, so I, I, 
I, I don't think we're really in a confusion. I think we might just be using some slightly different terms to talk about the same thing. Yeah, follow up with me. Follow, follow up with a second question if that didn't help with that, please. So uh, just he tacked on something here. He said that uh, now that it is uh, in his mind that it's referring to Macbeth, it seems much more simple than the Cadillacy than he had in mind before. So perhaps this is much more of a simplifying idea than uh, perhaps it had been uh, intended before. Oh, well, I, don't, I mean, I don't think that because it is a reference to the invisible hand of night concealing evil deeds, that it that it is limited to being only that reference, right? Um, a literary illusion serves to point us to something, but it doesn't have to limit the, um, it doesn't have to limit Smith to only meaning that, right? He can refer us to Macbeth while still also meaning what he means by the invisible hand, right? So he can mean by the invisible hand of the market all of these Hayekian and Misian things, right? While also referencing Macbeth in order to bring in the difference between the bloody and invisible hand of the state as opposed to the, um, the peaceful hand of the market. Right? A, reference isn't, a reference isn't limiting. It's, uh, it's expansive, if anything. Okay, great. We'll let the uh, questions roll in here. And your, uh, your chance to get on the horn here and uh, ask your question of Sarah Squire. You heard a great presentation. Now's your chance to give any sort of thoughts you may have. Oh, they seem shy. Oh, here we go. Here's one from Juan Ruiz Ramos again. Do you think the state is always okay. bloody? He asks. Uh, so the question is, am I an anarchist, right? I think <laughs> it sounds like that's the question. Um, I think the state is always using the power of state force in order to accomplish its ends. Do I think that always results in literal bloodshed? No. How's that for a KG reply? <laughs> yeah. Apologize for the car alarm, should... but we have one more from Remberto. Um, but the direct quote from Macbeth uh, wasn't it tied yeah. to the bloody hand? Was it not intended to be that? And then someone else said, good dodge. Oh, thank you. I'm glad it was a good dodge. Um, okay, wait, so the, give, give me the question again, please. I'm sorry. The, the direct in the, quote, in the direct quote uh, is, wasn't it tied to the bloody hand directly and not necessarily the invisible hand? Oh, yes. Um, in... in the original quote from Shakespeare is, with thy bloody and invisible hand. When Smith uses it, he drops the word bloody and just uses invisible hand. It seems most likely to most people that when Smith says the invisible hand, he has the Macbeth reference in mind. I think that it's significant that when Smith is talking about the marketplace, he drops the word bloody because the market is voluntary and peaceful. Yeah. Right, so it refers us back to it. It makes us think of Macbeth, but we aren't, we aren't limited to it. I'm trying to think of a good parallel example for you. He says now he does understand. So all those well. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Good. <laughs> good. Good. I was trying to think of a, of a good parallel example where uh, where we use a literary. Uh... Ah. Well. Okay. So in in uh, T. S. Eliot's great poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, he says, "I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was I meant to be." When he says that, the line means, "I am not the hero of this." drama of this drama of my life that I find myself in, right? I'm like a supporting character who stands in the background and isn't the main subject of the play, 
right? He does not mean I am not a Danish prince, who, the ghost of whose father has appeared to me and has asked me to murder my uncle because my uncle killed my father. He doesn't mean all of those things about Prince Hamlet, right? He's just referring to sort of part of what it means to be Prince Hamlet. So that the, the, the illusion, we have control over our illusions a little bit. Okay, all is good. Last chance, going once, going twice. Questions um, for the mention... Squire. The floor is yours. I should mention before we go that a longer um, discussion of several allusions to Shakespeare's work in Adam Smith that I wrote has appeared in a recent issue of the journal Laissez-Faire, which is published by University Francisco Marroquin. Um, and so that's available both in print and online. Um, and you should be able to find it by searching on my name and, Invisi and Invisible Shakespeare. And that should turn it up for you um, if you're interested in some other references to Shakespeare that appear in Smith's work and in seeing the other ways in which these two writers have interacted. We'll link that in the uh, Facebook event page for everyone and it, it, of course it has to come to the Latins to uh, be sure to connect culture to economics so all is well. Thank you very right, much. Well, I'd like uh, to thank you all very much. Thank you. Yes. It was a real pleasure. It's always a delight to do things for, for Students for Liberty. Um, and it was a treat getting to do a webinar when I'm actually awake. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yep, thank you. And we'll have uh, links and everything that we'll uh, have on, on the Facebook event page. And you can find all of our information, esfl.info. We'll have everything there. You can always go on the Facebook page, find everything as well. So believe me. We're going to have all the information, especially pertinent to this webinar, and you can stay tuned to the rest that we'll have for the rest of the season. Until now, signing off here from Vienna, and thank you to Sarah Squire out there in Indianapolis. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Take care.